Well, I'm very happy to have Peggy, Jackie, Mike, um, and Laura here today. And we have a few more people. There's Jay um, joining us and um, with some additional people registered, we'll of course allow them in as they join. But this is Roaring Fork Leadership's uh, resiliency experience. We started these back in May and have been doing them um, every week. We've only missed one with different um, practitioners, experts coming in to talk about different aspects of resiliency and leadership. And I think it, it was so um, a, a perfect topic because there's so many things I, it's like the Corona coaster, if you've ever heard of that term. Um, it's like, it's a process, right? That we're all experiencing in kind of a new environment dealing with a pandemic. And I've seen resiliency show up in multiple ways um, dealing one-on-one -on -one, in family dynamics in teams and groups um, and you know different kind of aspects of just independently like how am I showing up today I know is very different than how I was even three months ago and using different pieces of resiliency if it's um, some some cases it's um, empathy or compassion that we're going to be talking about today or if it's like decision making and just being um, kind of calm with self, right? That I, being okay, being uncomfortable is one of the things I talk about. It's like, it's, you know, there's so much uncertainty. Maybe if I can find just one piece of certainty in there, at least I can feel better, right? And have that sense of um, resiliency show up for myself. I think sometimes that adaptability, flexibility, if we find ourselves resisting, like what's going on there and just to get um, into that awareness of where you are and even accepting, right? So that some days are gonna be easier than others. So Laura is um, with us today and so uh, glad that she can go join us with um, her organization to talk about compassion and resilience. And I just think with her work in the mindfulness arena um, and the expertise that she brings working with, she was telling me about a year long program that she instructs with people from um, let's say around the world that she gets to bring together and here she's doing this for us on um, Roaring Fork Leadership and I know we got Peggy's um, a traveler even <laughs> a Zoom traveler right? <laughs> if we call it that um, and then we have some people right here from our valley and Mike are you local or are you um, somewhere else joining us from location Oops, so he paused. Mike, there you go. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, I am local, Glenwood okay. Springs. Perfect, perfect. Um, well, let's get started. Um, Laura, I know has some great conversations, some dialogue, I think some questions we're gonna be able to chat. And with a small group, um, I, I really do appreciate you having your video on. It does create more of a connection for all of us to engage in this conversation about compassion and resilience. So Laura, I'll pass it on to you. Thanks, Andrea, and thank you for inviting me. This is a treat to uh, to connect with Roaring Fork Leadership and, um, and get to participate in a series I was just thrilled to see it was happening. Uh, what an important topic. Um, so today I wanted to, you know, I've been watching all the different topics that have come up in the series, and I thought, what could I bring that would that would add to and, and sort of dial into an important aspect of resiliency. And I think compassion doesn't come up as the number one most obvious um, aspect of compassion, but it is a critical piece of compassion and so uh, of resiliency. And so I thought I would dial in on that because it's an area where there is some confusion. There is um, some uh, some habits we get into that don't support us and perhaps we think we're being compassionate or we um, step into that realm and, uh, and end up in a place that doesn't support us, perhaps um, leaning into burnout or um, overwhelm. So I thought it might be helpful to sort of tease apart some aspects of empathy and compassion and some of the practices that help us and experiences that help us recognize and, uh, and be in empathy and then move into compassion um, and, and talk about why. Why is that helpful? And so I'm sure 
in your world, you may have experienced that this need for the skills and qualities of resilience seem to increase daily. Now. Um, with pandemic to economic, political, environmental, social challenges on a large scale and in our own close circles um, and organizations. Um, with these challenges, so do the needs for empathy and compassion. Um, and not just to benefit others, but skillful empathy, wise compassion, these are some keys to our own resiliency. And I've been thinking about through this whole pandemic, I've been thinking about how um, developing ourselves and cultivating these long-term traits of resilience and well-being may be the most meaningful response to these current times. Um, sometimes we feel like we can't address it all, we can't fix it all, there's so much. Um, but how can we use this to really develop these long-term traits that allow us to have resilience in whatever comes our way, whatever condition shows up next, um, either in our own life or in the world we're living in. And so I'm glad you're here because I think this is, this is part of it. Uh, so thanks for, thanks for joining today and, and even thanks for those of you who may be watching this afterwards. So in leadership over the past decade and more, there's been this real broad effort to bring the skills of empathy to organizations, to various professions. And interestingly, there have been some downfalls of that. Now, the Wall Street Journal I was noting uh, in 2016 said that one in five organizations were providing training in empathy. Uh, and it's been aimed at leaders by um, helping leaders be better listeners, more connected, more understanding, more responsive. And all that is essential. It's important. Um, there are some downsides. So that's what we're, we're going to talk about that. Um, there's a book out called The Empathy Effect uh, by uh, um, a woman named Helen Rice. She says that empathy is best understood as a human capacity consisting of several different facets that work together to enable us to be moved by the plights and emotions of others. So that is a description that I think works pretty well. And you, you've experienced it, I'm sure, many, many times where you've been aware of suffering, someone who's in pain, hear a news story, and it moves you. You feel that experience. Um, so we'll talk about that. Now, compassion um, is held up as a wonderful ideal, but it may be treacherous territory for some of us. Um, we may have some aversion towards being more compassionate. We may even fear being more compassionate. We might think, oh, it's, I can't do another thing. It's going to fatigue me even more. Um, we might think it, it's going to um, add anxiety and stress, uh, that we might lose our boundaries um, and step outside of them. Uh, and we might even, in a, especially in a leadership position, might even feel that being more compassionate, we might be judged as weak or unprofessional even. Um, and we might even think about that compassion will make us prioritize sympathy over justice. Um, and that could be dangerous territory for us. So, so I'm just highlighting there's some interesting things about empathy and compassion. I wanted to start with a more experiential exercise with you. And uh, I want to see if that, this little exercise helps you to touch into the difference within yourself of feeling empathy and feeling compassion. So I hope you're on board and willing to, um, to play a little bit with this. So I'm going to invite you to, um, to sit up nicely, get your feet on the floor, 
if they aren't already. And only if you're comfortable, I'll invite you to close your eyes. If you're not, that's not a problem at all. But uh, if you're comfortable, I'll invite you to do so. And we're gonna start by just kind of noticing our bodies, bringing our awareness into our bodies. And then I'm gonna invite you to drop your awareness right down to your feet. So just see if you can narrow your awareness so that all you're paying attention to are the sensations happening right now in your two feet. So you might notice the weight of your feet on the floor. You might notice a tingling or buzzing sensation in different parts of your feet. Maybe given it's been a very cold morning here, you might even notice different temperatures from the front of your feet, the toes, to the arch, to the heels, top or bottom of your feet. And now that we've paid attention to these general sensations, I'm gonna invite you to narrow your awareness just a bit more so that you move your awareness and narrow it just to your left foot. See if you can pay attention just to your left foot. And now play with me with your attention so that you narrow your attention and pay attention only to the heel of your left foot. See if you can move your awareness to the toes of your left foot. Can you move your awareness to the toes of your right foot? How about the arch of the right foot? What do you notice right now in the arch? And then gently expand your awareness back to both feet. And gently open your eyes. So that's a very simple exercise that allows us to ground in the present moment because these sensations that we pay attention to are only occurring in this moment. They're not in the past, they're not in the future. So this is a way to arrive and arrive in our bodies. So having done that, we'll move on to the next part of this experience. And I'm gonna invite you, and you can close your eyes again if you're comfortable. I'm going to invite you to call to mind a family who is struggling financially due to COVID. One of the parents is a long hauler who's already had COVID. The children are doing online school from home. There's some challenges juggling all of that. Financial fears are strong. Their mortgage is due. They're not sure how they're gonna make it. The main breadwinner of the family's company may lay them off soon. So I invite you just to spend some time visually, visualizing them in their situation, imagining their conditions, their experiences. Imagine being there in their home. See if you can be aware of their facial expressions, their posture, their movements. Can you hear snippets of the conversations? Maybe even feel the anxiety. Now, I want you to notice the feelings within yourself right now. Check in with your body right now. Notice what thoughts you're having.
then now let's shift from imagining their situation being in their living room to intentionally, as best as you can, generating feelings of care for them, of kindness for them. Now, you might even bring a smile to your face or bring your hand to your heart, to your chest. See if you can generate and bring an attitude of openness, generosity, wishes for their well-being. You might even privately, internally say to yourself, may they be well, may they be supported. And now again, notice the feelings within yourself. Check in with your body. What thoughts are you having right now? And now I invite you to open your eyes, come back to our group. And I'd love to hear if you had a different experience sitting with their suffering versus extending care and concern. That's a, intentionally generated sense of kindness and wish for their well-being. I'm just curious, did you have any difference in your experience between those two stages of our experience? Anyone willing to pop their mic on and share it all? Yeah, I'd like to share. Um, yeah, it felt like the the empathy and just trying to relate to their experience was like first gear for me. So mm -hmm. it was like a slow, just kind of in the moment, um, imagining, but then for wanting to um, kind of bless them and see them experience something different was like going to second or third gear. And so it felt like it was a lot more energizing for, for me and could feel that in my body and my mind started going in different directions as I thought of what would I want them to experience. Mm. Oh, thanks, Mike. You know, anyone else want to share before I, I um, talk a little bit about the research that has been done in an experience just like this? Anyone else have an experience that they want to share? Yeah, Jay. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I, I found that before you even brought up uh, being generous and like offering what you can offer to them, I felt myself already kind of jumping to that, I suppose. Um, but then also, uh, I don't know, I guess it was just interesting because I know that I jumped to the idea of like wanting to comfort them, but then also not being able to hug them or something just because of COVID. And I, I, that just, I don't know, that was fascinating to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. There, it's interesting uh, when we do feel uh, that sense of empathy, what can get in the way of taking that next step? I mean, it may be just the simple fact that, you know, we're dealing with a contagious disease and we can't do some of the things that we naturally uh, are wired to do. So I had you go through this experience um, because I wanted you to, to feel this before I talked about the research. So, um, a number of years ago, a researcher in Germany did an experiment just like this um, and had a, a long-term meditator um, in a functional MRI machine where they can look at activity in the brain. And uh, the person that they put in there is uh, a man named Matthew Ricard, long-term meditator. And the night before he did this, he had watched a documentary, a BBC documentary, on the orphanages in Romania. And if you remember back in uh, the end of the 80s, um, 
there was a great awareness all of a sudden of um, some of the uh, very uh, tragic treatment of orphans in orphanages in Romania um, and after the fall of um, that regime in 89 um, sort of word got out and and there was a lot of awareness about this horrendous situations and so Matthew Ricard had just watched a documentary and so in the fMRI machine uh, the researchers wanted to study what happened in the brain when he generated empathy and generated compassion. Did she freeze up for everybody? Yeah, okay. Let's see. I just lost power at my house, so I'm guessing that okay. she also lost power. <laughs> yep. Oh, there she's back. Oh. Okay. Okay. And I, I'm in the dark because our power just went out in our building. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Okay, good. All right. So I know they have a backup generator. I hope they got it on. I've been able to switch to my hotspot. So we are we are being resilient, technolog technologically resilient here. Um, so in this study, they wanted him to generate and touch into that state of empathy. So he immersed himself in what he remembered from the documentary the night before in the suffering of these children, visualizing them vividly, sensing their situations um, and what he learned about them. And then after a period of time, they invited him to move on to a compassion meditation. So sort of continuing to focus on the suffering but now to intentionally generate these attitudes of kindness, uh, love, concern, altruism, generosity, um, and bring it in the face of the awareness of that suffering. And, um, and what they noticed, and this has been uh, looked at again and again now, is that in empathy, the part of our brain that actually lights up is the part of the brain that is lighting up in those that are suffering also. So we experience a similar type um, and feeling of that suffering. But interestingly, nature does a good job of toning it down for us. We get a sense of it, but it's lower so that we aren't in the extreme amount of suffering that let's say those children are, giving us the capacity to be aware of and feel into, um, but not necessarily, uh, if it's balanced, if it's managed, um, not necessarily be flooded or overwhelmed as much with it as they might be, giving us the chance to possibly move into compassion. And then what they noticed in this study is that when he generated compassion, other parts of the brain lit up and those parts of the brain are associated with positive emotion, maternal love, feelings of affiliation, um, and that's what he was experiencing. And he said, Subs subsequently engaging in compassion meditation completely altered my mental landscape. Although the images of the suffering children were still as vivid as before, they no longer induced distress. Instead, I felt a natural and boundless love for these children and the courage to approach and console them. In addition, the distance between myself and the children had completely disappeared. And so when we think about empathy and compassion, we can see that empathy is that feeling with, and as we move into compassion, it's more of an active state. And Mike, as you said, more energy, more, um, uh, more positive qualities can be experienced in compassion where empathy can go different directions. So resilience is a complex set of skills and qualities. Andrea and I were talking a little bit before about all the different kinds of things that can go into resilience um, that reduces our suffering even if it doesn't change or fix the situation. So he wasn't changing or fixing that situation, but he was practicing some things that add to resilience. 
And when we are more resilient and strong, we have a better chance at effecting or bringing about change, of being uh, to, of help to those around us. And as leaders, um, as leaders, our own resilience can have a positive effect, not only on those that are benefiting directly, um, those around us, those that may rely on us, um, but even those who witness us being resilient and compassionate. So coping well with suffering, and, and as we mentioned, there's, we're aware of a lot of suffering these days in the news and in our neighborhoods. Coping well with suffering, we move from empathy to compassion, and they are not the same thing. Although there's a lot of um, uh, interchanging of those terms, there's, um, there's, uh, there's even researchers that uh, seem to conflate those terms. So it's very important to, to be thoughtful about what, what is being studied and, um, and what do we know about things. So <clears throat> empathy actually activates those parts of our technology. Let's see if it just comes back here momentarily. Jay's, how, how's power at your place? Is it, you're hanging in there? Carbondale? No, I actually don't have any power here. Nothing. So it could be the generator or something going on, of course. Uh, I think she's at the Third Street Center. Please bear with us. We'll see if we can get her back. Oh, that, she just signed off. So my guess is she'll try to jump back in. I've uh, done my own research on empathy and um, just to kind of fill a little time. Um, what I've seen is uh, the level of empathy that exists today, let's say on our planet, has been, is reduced compared to what it was probably five or 10 years ago. Um, and I, I think I would add that I, th like the, how fast paced things have become, um, the use of technology. I would even say that um, when we're not able to connect as we normally can, Jay, to that point of like wanting to hug somebody and you can't, I think there's a lot of these pieces that are show up that actually we don't probably aren't as conscious or aware of our behaviors that reflect empathy towards others. I don't know if anybody can see that even in themselves of, you know, if you say, hey, like I, like I like to do assessments of myself, like before I go to bed and like, where did empathy show up today? You know, if that's something that I'm trying to work on, or in this case of this conversation, compassion, did compassion show up in my day? Did I show, you know, was it um, appropriate for me? Did I show it appropriately? Did I not? Could I have shown it in a different way that would have connected differently with that person? So I find um, that empathy, and, and there are some studies out there around empathy related to the younger generations, let's just say the millennials or kids in college today, and a lot of it does have to do with the phones, right? Like how, if you think of how you're connecting on phones and devices, um, even computers, and I know my computer usage and screen time has gone up significantly since March. I don't know. Like I, I, I thought I saw one day my phone said I had six hours. I'm like, oh my God, it's off. <laughs> what am I doing, right? And um, to try to adjust those behaviors to realize like, wow. Um, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, there's that correlation of screen time going up and empathy going down. Um, anybody else having experiences like that right now that they want to, I see Laura's trying to get back. Any, anybody else seeing that observation in the world? <laughs> or even within themselves, that consciousness of how you're being empathetic or compassionate. It's something to think about, right? How those behaviors are actually showing up with each of, each of us. Laura, I filled the air while I was guessing you were trying to figure out how to come back in on um, talking a little bit about, tr I think, trends that I'm seeing about empathy related to that, I think with devices, computers, phones, even with the pandemic probably 
pushing us to use screens to create connections, that that level of empathy has been decreasing, even with millennials, there's studies that show that, that um, I just made the question out to everybody is to like, at the end of the day, ask how did empathy or compassion show up? Did I show it in a way that was supportive, helpful? Could I have done it in a different way that have, could have created a more, um, a stronger connection? So that's where we left it when you came back. Great, thank you. I, yeah, we are uh, rolling through some, some challenges here in our, in our building. Um, so yeah, thanks for keeping that rolling and I'm glad I could come back and I hope I can stay here. Um, so I was saying that um, there are two pathways uh, when, we, uh, when we experience that sense of empathy that um, I brought you into with uh, thinking of that um, family uh, who had been affected by COVID, um, working with challenges. And so one is empathic distress. And um, while I have some slides, I'm not sure I want to um, uh, venture into sharing them right now in case I causes some issues. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about them. So empathic distress, um, this is the path that leads us to um, into overwhelm, over arousal, and, and burnout. So these sort of chronic levels. But I imagine that you have experienced empathic distress, even on a momentary level. And I, I was thinking about an experience I had um, years ago when I was, uh, I was a consultant, I had a, um, a consultancy uh, here in the same building, and I worked alone, and a friend um, who was older, um, retired, would call me midday. They knew I was there alone um, working, and they would call and say, did you see the headlines? Oh, it's tragic. Did you see that tragic thing that happened? And, and they would be filled with this sense of empathy, but getting weighed down by it, getting stuck in that place of empathy. And I'm sure you've, you've had that feeling where you, you feel that, um, that suffering, and then, and then it's taking us to, in a direction towards um, being, being weighed down. And that in itself isn't the issue, but when we can become aware of that, then we have choice, then we have an option. Um, the other option uh, is taking our sense of empathy towards compassion. Um, so ideally, empathy is this stepping stone to, to compassion. Um, Joan Halifax, a researcher and um, contemplative, says empathic distress is an aversive emotional reaction that can lead us to avoid rather than serve others. She calls it falling over the edge of empathy. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's important to be aware of um, how empathic distress um, are close to where we can go in terms of hearing so much that we end up, and, and this happens in some professions, some of you uh, may be aware of this in your own profession, where we, we even experience secondary or vicarious trauma. Um, so um, some, some, some problematic pathways, uh, starting with empathy, empathy to be very aware of. Um, and some people will say um, that is called compassion fatigue, but it's actually empathy fatigue. And I think that's one thing that we can clear up, empathy fatigue, where I am taking empathy to, into that direction where it's not serving me, it's not serving others. Um, you might also hear people say, you know what my problem is, I just have too much compassion. Well, Mike just said the compassion experience energized him. If you think of Mother Teresa, I mean, she had endless, boundless energy. When we think of people who embody true, deep uh, compassion, they seem to have endless energy. Um, so it's interesting to note, and when we look at those brain studies, we see that that's um, an experience that actually energizes us rather than depletes us. So when we are experiencing uh, and around and aware of 
challenges, whether it's our employees, our family members, our community members, this is a time to check in with ourselves. I'm noticing suffering. I'm aware of. And then to check, you know, what am I doing with that? What is my habitual way of responding or what has become right now, these many months into uh, the pandemic, what has become perhaps my habitual way? And it may change day to day. Maybe today I'm feeling more energized and capable and tomorrow I'm feeling um, maybe I'm uh, not feeling well or I didn't sleep well. So, so these things can vary. Um, so um, so the, the goal is to check in and then see if we can use that connection, that empathy um, to move into, to use it for good, to actively shift. And this is what I want to work with, you know, today, the rest of our time on is how do we actually make that shift? So in our um, little experience that we did earlier, it was because I asked you. I asked you to make an intentional shift. Um, and that is something that you can do if you're aware enough of being, uh, experiencing empathy, you can make an intentional shift. So it could be as simple as this. Oh, wow, I just heard that story. It's so tragic. I feel so sad for them. Really, I can't, I can imagine, I can, I can feel, I'm noticing it in my body. I'm noticing the thoughts I'm having moving too. I'd like to see if there's anything I could do to help. Now, just as I said that, I felt more energized just by those words. Um, so our experience can change very quickly, just even in our words um, and where we place our attention. And as I said, so compassion is activating that part of our brain that's associated with affiliation, with reward. And this is why I say it it doesn't just support others, but it's part of our own resilience skills, having a deep tie to, um, to our own well-being. Uh, I mentioned Joan Halifax before. She talks about edge states um, and altruism, empathy, um, integrity, uh, respect, things like this. And then she talks about how these, we, imagine being sort of walking on a precipice that falls off both ways, I think nearby here, the, um, the knife edge of uh, Capitol Peak. So we could go either way and we can fall quick and far in either direction. Um, and, and with all these things, um, we have different directions that we can go. And with empathy, um, and with all these things, she says, compassion is the path out of the toxic aspects of the edge states. So bring us back to that precipice and choose the path that we want to go. And as I mentioned, empathy has been an area that's had a lot of study, but now you see compassion being that sort of um, revolution, the new frontier of neuroscience, psychology, training programs. Um, the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education, that's CCARE, that's at Stanford. Emory University has another um, very um, active uh, center for study of compassion. Um, so these are, are uh, this is sort of where we're headed. And I think um, what, what, was, uh, what we've been aware of is if we just train in empathy without really bridging to compassion, we're leaving people hanging. Where we, they get there, they make the connection, and then what? We might not end up on the right side of that precipice. So, so here we have the opportunity to, to practice um, standing on that pre precipice, knowing that we're standing on that precipice, and then looking at our choices and being more aware of uh, the risks of one side and the benefits of the other. So with mindfulness, we develop the capacities to A, 
first be aware. Andrea and I were talking about this earlier, just awareness, attention, being present with our emotions, our thoughts. Uh, and so this is a big part of uh, awareness, uh, uh, of mindfulness. One of the teachers that I've worked with for years says that one of our biggest problems is something called OCDD. Not OCD that we find in um, DSM, but obsessive compulsive delusional disorder. And so obsessive meaning that our minds are constantly generating thoughts. They're just obsessively thinking. It's coming again and again and dragging us all around. So compulsive, the next part, it does. It, one of those thoughts grabs us, takes us on a ride. Maybe you've had the experience of a worry popping up. We don't know where that worry came from. Like, oh, I don't need to worry about that. That doesn't even make sense, but it pops up. And then it grabs us. And then that's all we're thinking about. So it's taken us for a ride. So obsessive then becomes can become compulsively thinking, rumination, worry, and then delusional. So if my worry is um, that, you know, and, I, and I'll bring an experience from my own life. Years ago, I was a single mom, and, um, and I, I remember feeling a little lonely. I was dealing with some major ch um, health challenges with my, both my sons and myself, my parents, there was quite a bit going on at the same time. I felt a little lonely going through this and I, and I felt like, oh, I don't have a partner to lean into. And, 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 I, and, and that thought, you know, it's about 2 a.m. that it's the worst, right? So it pops up, 2 a.m., I'm lonely. And then it starts into the delusion. I'm always gonna be lonely. Nobody's there for me, right? That's not true. It's not real, but that's the delusional thought that is generated easily, and then I'm off and running into the delusion. So you can see this OCDD um, may be something that you have some experience with. I certainly have experience with it. And, and so in uh, living mindfully, the first step is to develop the ability to be present uh, in this moment. And then we get choice. So if I'm present in this moment, as I had you do, checking in, just arriving in this moment with your feet, you no longer probably had the capacity to worry about something in the past or worry about something in the future. You were here. I gave you, I invited you to have full attention on your feet. That left us no space or room or capacity to be in the past or the future. And so as we arrive in this moment, um, it allows us an opportunity to then be aware of what's going on. So now I might be aware that I'm feeling empathetic about a, an employee, a family member, news that I just heard. I'm aware, I just begin to, to be aware of that. And now my as I develop the capacity, the muscle of attention, I'm actually able to choose one thought over another. So if I notice the, uh, a thought that leads me towards empathic distress starting to pop up and be compulsively dragging me towards even a delusional thought, my developed attention through a mindfulness practice gives me the chance to choose a thought that's more beneficial. So now I can notice, I can be present, and now I can shift towards a thought that uh, is intentional. So again, choice, intention. I can be aware of and in the moment choose an intentional direction. So just as I had you choose the intentionally generating care or concern, um, that gives us the choice. Um, Another aspect of compassion is wisdom. Now, I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the concerns sometimes with compassion is, yeah, oh, if, I'm, if I'm compassionate towards this person or this group of people, um, I might be overextended, I might 
get beyond my boundaries, I might wear myself out. So wisdom comes in. Because wisdom says this. It says that wisdom is that wish for or the action of truly removing some of the suffering. So I have to be wise about that. If actions take me beyond my boundaries, then I'm not being compassionate to myself. If actions are perhaps even um, uh, helping someone in the short term, but not in the long term. We see this with um, the support of, around addiction sometimes. You know, a, a friend perhaps is dealing with addiction and, and there's that um, step we take that really uh, helps them in the short term, but not in the long term. So, um, so here is where wisdom comes in. John and I were uh, interviewing um, a Buddhist monk one time on uh, Grassroots TV in Aspen, and we asked him about compassion and how the world, you know, does the world need more compassion? Tell us about your thoughts. And he said, yeah, we need more compassion, but not that stupid kind of compassion. Um, and so that kind of compassion that doesn't bring in uh, wisdom with it. So I, uh, I did have some slides, but I'm going to just share with you. Um, there are some practices that can help us to skillfully develop our empathy. And there's four parts to them. So I'm going to um, I'm going to share them with you. Um, one is this first step I've just been talking about, which is focusing our attention on our body to ground, as we did with ground, ground, grounding in our feet, um, so that we can enhance our capacity uh, to attune to our physical sensations, which sometimes can even help us um, to attune to what someone else might be experiencing. So being in our own bodies being centered and in touch with our own, um, our own sensations, our own experience, physically, emotionally. The second uh, is deep listening. So if I'm really able to listen um, clearly and cleanly so that I'm not projecting, I'm not layering, I'm really hearing what's truly going on. Um, so that's the second step. So first I ground, I'm uh, then I move into really listening. Um, and then the third practice is to really kind of steward that empathic response. Let me really connect. This is another being, human or not. Maybe it's a pet, maybe it's um, some wildlife that's in distress, but I really steward that empathic response. So I connect in um, with that sense. And then the fourth is using our imagination um, to, to cultivate uh, where I could go from there, right? So now I'm saying, let me open up, not let, let me narrow in, but let me expand to the potentials now that I'm in this space and I know I'm in this space. Um, and again, I'm referencing Joan Fallon, Halifax here, she has this wonderful mnemonic, GRACE, that stands for the steps that she uses to move into compassion. So we've talked about four steps with empathy. Now we'll move into four steps, or these steps, five steps, with compassion. So the G stands for gathering our attention. So we come back to that. We gather our attention. And the second is what I invited you to do, is to have an intention. So you may recall intention that you generally hold. So J was uh, moved e easily into, um, into uh, wishing for well-being, wanting to, to do something. You can take that moment to recall your intention. What in this moment would I like to intend to move towards that would be beneficial? Um, the A in the grace is attuning um, to self and others so that we can start to actually bring in um, that uh, even more connection 
So intention, connection, so that I can get to see, which is considering, and this is where wisdom comes in, what will actually serve, what will be beneficial, um, not just um, uh, what I want to do, or sometimes even how I want to appear, right? So um, sometimes our own ego, or our, our pride, I want to be the one who takes this step, um, but considering what will truly be beneficial, and then the E, then engaging. Um, and she actually adds ending, engage and end. So we want to conclude that process so that, we, um, that we've stepped through uh, compassion um, and the actions uh, wisely. And we, we, um, we move with that. So, um, so there's lots and lots of studies um, that, uh, let's see, I'm, okay, great. I was just checking the chat. Thank you, um, Mike, for, for writing out those steps. That's lovely. Um, so there are um, lots of studies that help us to begin to understand the nuances of both empathy and compassion. But there's real benefit in first person experience. And so without adding in all these studies, what I'm gonna invite you to, um, to bring into your experience is awareness, observation. So as we are more attuned, more aware, we slow down, um, we become more curious about our own experience of empathy and what our habits and um, tendencies are, maybe in the past and maybe right now. Um, and we're more curious about um, what allows compassion to arise for us, that openness to, um, to wish um, for others' uh, um, re reduction or resolution to their suffering, or asking, what can I do? What action can I take? Um, so the invitation is this awareness, to really start there with awareness and observation and use it as this study of yourself. What happens when I'm reading the news? What happens when a friend is uh, dealing with something? What happens when an employee or our community is, um, is experiencing some challenges? Where do I go from that precipice? Um, which edge do I choose? Um, so if I had lots more time, we could go into more of the practices, but this is the invitation is to move into first awareness, arriving, slowing down, becoming aware of what is typical for you right now and being aware of whether you're feeling weight that's taking you towards empathic distress, or um, if you have the opportunity, because you're aware of empathy, to set an intention that takes you in the direction of compassion. And so I'm, I'm curious right now, um, I had a slide. Let me see if I can just pull it up on my own uh, thing. I'm curious how well um, how well do you consider yourself to be responding to current challenges and changes as it relates to your own well-being? So on a scale of one, meaning ah, one, I'm not really uh, responding in ways that are really beneficial to myself and others right now, or 10, I'm doing pretty well. And, and um, you can think that to yourself. You can chat in a number, um, but I'm just curious how you're doing right now. Okay, thanks, Andrea. Yeah, um, great. Okay. Now, on a given day, that's going to change, right? Um, and so that's where this awareness comes in. Today, this is my answer. Tomorrow, conditions are different, situation is different, 
I'm different, the answer can change. In a mindfulness practice, over time, we develop these long-term traits that support us to have higher, the, that, that answer be higher over time and less impacted by the situations that we're in. Um, so this is the long-term goal with a mindfulness practice is to develop the long-term traits that support us over time, not knowing whether, you know, tomorrow there's a pandemic or uh, a financial crash or um, I break my leg. You know, we don't know these things. We don't know what's around the corner. So my invitation is also to invite you to, um, to see about what, what practices you can put in place. And uh, again, I had a slide about some of the personal uh, resources and professional trainings that we do here at the Mindful Life Program. We have lots of resources, ongoing support, um, at even um, a Mindful Life community and a mindfulness and recovery community where you can have daily support and guidance and connection. Because um, we are, we're not good at sometimes doing these changes and developing these things on our own. So having, um, having daily um, prompts, supports, and, uh, and guidance can be really helpful. Um, so I know we, we have a few minutes left. I want to see if there's any, <clears throat> any question um, from anyone uh, that I could address that could be helpful before we wrap up. Um, so any thoughts, any questions, any experiences um, that anyone wants to pop in and share? I'll, I'll um, share. I think, you know, it's interesting when you ask the question to kind of give a, a number, right, to that experience. It's, it's interesting. Like this morning, I would even have said my number was higher than where it at, you know, where it is being more connected to it and more conscious of where it is. Um, and I, I would say, even though my number is a five, it's like, I wish it was an eight, right? Like, it's like, oh, it, it should be an eight. And I have skills to do better. And I know what it takes. But of course, it's just like being in this conversation today was just to allow. It's like, you know what? No, <laughs> it's like, you don't have to have the answers. You can be where you're at. And accepting that, I think, even brings light right to that opportunity you talked about to have a choice point you know what i mean to say maybe it's okay just to be at a five today you know what i mean maybe there's some exhaustion going on that five is honestly good you know mm -hmm. in, in how it works and then tomorrow whatever could be going on might take you to that six or seven or eight because i'm again it's that corona coaster that i mentioned before would you yeah. would you say that's um pretty normal yeah well and also it's it's first bringing that awareness and that acceptance to this is where i'm at so that i can bring the wisdom that says hey you know i can't actually do anything about where i'm at until i accept that this is where i'm at right if i keep ignoring brushing it aside that that maybe i'm not doing so well maybe this i'm at a challenging point it we all get there we all have those challenges um and sometimes they're they're extensive and complex challenges and and so this is where that wisdom comes in from awareness is now i get to say what would be helpful um but until i can be aware and accept it i can't get to solution mode right. i'm still in denial mode. yeah or just um numb or i'm i'm blind to it or i'm habitually sweeping it aside um so you know, sometimes that's an uncomfortable uh, awareness, but it does get us to a place where we can start to make some healthier choices um, given the situation we're at, yeah. we're in right now. Well, yeah. Laura, um, would you be willing to share some of those, maybe, I don't know if it's a slide or a reference sheet. I know you have amazing classes at Mindful Life programs that you were providing that I think would be great. And I could just email that out based on who attended, you know, um, through the registration. I have everybody's email that I could just do that one follow up with you. And the, yes, I absolutely will. I'll, I'll uh, change it from a PowerPoint to a PDF so that anyone can open it and, uh, and, and send that to you. And 
then everyone can have access. What an interesting, uh, you know, opportunity I had. You were still, I'm still sitting here in the dark. Um, so, uh, and luckily my, my hotspot um, has held. So uh, thanks for rolling with this. And, um, and I hope um, there was something beneficial for you, even in just taking the time to consider um, what your habits and tendencies are right now and what might be helpful for you. As you uh, as you move forward, as we move into winter, um, and our next steps uh, through these interesting times. So, well, thank you, thank so you, much. Yeah. Thanks, thank everyone. Thank you, Laura. And of course, join us every Tuesday. Um, next week, I have Clark Anderson from Community Builders going to talk about community resilience. Um, and then on November 10th, I have a pre-crisis leadership with a retired colonel um, from the Air Force, Pierre Powell. So I really look forward to those upcoming ones. You can find it on rfleadership.org and just go to our events page. Go ahead and register. I'll get better at sending reminders of those registrations. And again, thank you so much for being with us and Laura for what you contributed to the group here today. Thank you. Y'all have a good rest of the day. Thanks to everyone. Thank you both. Bye.